they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you, all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning and welcome you all in the name of Jesus. It's an honor and a blessing to have Dr. Prabhuda Singh uh, Anna from uh, Bangalore. I don't know if you remember, but about four to five years ago, um, Anna was our retreat speaker uh, when Pastor Martin was there. So it's definitely a blessing to have him uh, amidst us this morning. I'm going to invite uh, Dela's uncle to introduce, and no uncle, uncle is saying. <laughs> Just a few words about uh, Anna, and then uh, we'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Prabhu Singh. Praise the Lord. Uh, glad to be back for a long time. Okay. Uh, Dr. Prabhu Singh, uh, uh, he was born and brought up in Tutukudi, in former Tenavali district. Then uh, from Tutukudi, he moved to Palangote for his undergrad studies. He did his undergrad at St. John's College, Palangote. During that time, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Then after his graduation, he joined uh, Ambassador for Christ, another organization, evangelical organization. After that, he moved to Asbury in Kentucky. He did his PhD in theology. Uh, I think Dr. Kamalashan also did his PhD there. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Then um, he accepted a position as the principal at SIAX, South Asian Institute of Advanced Christian Studies in Bangalore. He is married to Sheba, daughter of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pushparai <laughs> uh, of uh, Jamakara Ministries in Salem. Yeah, I know that family for a long time. Yeah, so we are, uh, yeah, we are fortunate to have Dr. Prabhu Singh among us. Thank you. you, Uncle, for the kind words of introduction. I want to thank God for giving me this opportunity. I want to thank the children for their wonderful worship and uh, beautiful prayer and testimony, and may the Lord bless you, and may you continue to grow in his likeness. So it's so beautiful to see children uh, participate actively in the worship service. And um, because I'm here, last time when I came, I was a uh, Professor, I teach uh, cultural anthropology uh, at my school, and then last four years ago, I was invited to be the principal of the school, and uh, we live in Bangalore, and of course, as you know, things are not as easy as it used to be, uh, even in the midst of great uh, opposition, uh, we continue to operate. Uh, we have our theological education from masters all the way to PhD, we train missionaries as you continue to Pray for pastors and missionaries. I would encourage you to continue to pray for good theological education uh, and institutions, right? Because they are the ones who develop this next generation of kingdom workers. So I would encourage you to continue to pray for us. I'm here. Uh, uh, I've been recently accepted as the as a board of uh, part of the board of trustees of my school where I studied Asbury Seminary, which is one of the top five uh, schools, uh, theological schools uh, in the country. And uh, this is our 100th uh, year, 100th anniversary we just celebrated. So I came here uh, to combine that. And our school back home, uh, SIAX is celebrating its 40th anniversary. So we are, you know, so many things uh, uh, we have combined. And uh, so I've been here now for nearly two weeks in the US. It's a long uh, trip, uh, I'm just ready to go. Uh, back to Bangalore. I arrived uh, two days in, uh, it was in two days in Atlanta and then two days in Connecticut, two days in Kentucky, and I flew all the way to San Jose for four days and then went back to Kentucky for the celebration for another four days. And now I'm here for two days and uh, one more day in Seattle, then go back to Atlanta and then return to India. So now you know that, you know, I'm a little disoriented this morning <laughs> as I speak. <laughs> I was telling my wife this morning, uh, you know, um, 
I'm used to, I grew up as an itinerant evangelist. In India, you, you travel like 30 hours, 40 hours by train, go from place to place by buses, and uh, there also sometimes you get uh, really disoriented. But what is my struggle in the US is because of the time difference here within the country, right? So that really throws you off the, uh, you know, off the equilibrium. Uh, so much yesterday after a long flight from Atlanta to Portland, uh, it was uh, pretty dark, even though I came around 6 o'clock, but the you know flight was dark, and uh, uh, we got up, and there's a long queue to get out quickly, so I picked up my suitcase, and I, you know, rushed outside, and then suddenly when I just came out of the, you know, the right into the gate, into the airport, suddenly I noticed, uh, how come my black color suitcase has become gray color, okay? <laughs> and, then, and then I suddenly realized I had picked up someone else's suitcase, okay? <laughs> And came out, and uh, uh, thankfully, I found out right there itself, and then I waited, and uh, then the actual owners came, and then they picked up my suitcase. I know that, you know, okay, it's really, uh, you know, disorienting. And uh, in darkness, right, sometimes in darkness can create a lot of disorientation. So all my most 30 years of traveling ministry, most of the time, I always sleep with my lights on, because when I wake up often, I do not know where I am. So darkness sometimes bring disorientation. And I want to talk to you today about a dark situation in the life of David. When we lived here in Kentucky for six years, my wife and I, we remember going to a cave uh, just on the borders of Kentucky. And they said that cave has the largest uh, underground water, under underwater uh, you know, uh, lake in the whole country. So we got to go down into the cave, pretty dark. And uh, I do not know how we both went in along with our friends because uh, ever since we were in the midst of that uh, big earthquake that happened in Gujarat, you know, way back in 2001, uh, you know, we are really afraid of all these caves. But somehow we decided, let's go in. And I still remember this huge, massive, you know, underground lake. And you can go on a boating uh, it's pitch dark, but as you go, there are a little bit lights here and there, and you can see in those lights, the lakes have got a lot of uh, fish in that, okay? Uh, but what's interesting about those fish are they're like beautiful fish, like rainbow trout and other fish, but what had happened now is that because of being underground, they have completely lost all the, you know, uh, color in their skin. They all have become grown white, and many of them have even grown blind. They are they can't see, they have lost their color, and they just merely exist. And sometimes when we go through cave situations, that what, that's what can happen to you and me. There are people who get through, go through cave circumstances and come out strengthened in their faith. And there are people who go through cave circumstances and lose their faith. It can happen to uh, any of the people. But here in David's life, at a crucial moment, he goes through a cave experience, and I want to st talk to you briefly today how you and I, along with David, can conquer our own cave, our own cave experiences. So the passage for us would, uh, is from First Samuel chapter 22. Um, every year I do a series of studies, uh, and last year I did a series of studies for my school from the life of David, and. Uh, and one of the things we spent so much time on David's life was the wilderness years, right? Often we come to David, uh, the great story of, you know, David and Goliath. And often then we jump to the, you know, David uh, and the king and then probably David to Bathsheba, you know, some of these key moments. But the whole uh, period of this wilderness experience of David, we tend to sometimes overlook. So I wanted to... We were doing a series of studies on this, and now we see here David in chapter 22. You know, just two, two uh, three chapters earlier, right, David was the darling of the nation, right? No one expected this young David, who even his own father didn't ki think of him as a kingly material, okay? Uh, you remember when Samuel goes to, uh, to anoint uh, one of the sons of Jesse, right? God told him, go. And you anoint one of the sons of Jesse, right? That's a familiar passage we know in chapter 16. And David and Samuel goes there and he asks one after the other son comes, right? All of these are handsome young men, tall. And so Samuel, every time the first, second, third comes, he says, oh, this should be the man, right? This should be the man. 
And what would God say? Right? No, God doesn't look at the outward appearance as we see. Why do you think Samuel acted like that? Any idea? Why did Samuel act? Uh, why did he act like that? Because probably he was he was falling upon his former experience, right? Saul was, we read, when Saul was anointed, he was the tallest guy, right? Almost a foot, a head and shoulder above everybody. So Samuel probably in his mind, as wise as he was, uh, but in his mind he would have thought, you know, all guys are going to be the same, right? That's why the Lord was saying, don't emphasis on the physical appearance, Samuel, but I'm going to, I'm the Lord who looks into the heart. Seven sons have passed by, and the Lord says, you know, not this, not this, not this. And we would have expected God would tell Samuel, Samuel, you go, go to Bethlehem, go to the house of Jesse. This is what the Lord says. And he would have said, oh, go and find David, and you anoint him. God didn't say that, right? If you notice how God guides you and me, God often gives us light for the next step. And once you obey that next step, further light will be given. Further light will be given. When we finished our studies here, I did my PhD in 2008. I wrote on the persecution. My thesis was on the persecution of the church. And when I finished, there were a lot of people who encouraged me not to return back uh, because of the issue of persecution. And there were so many things that are going on. And yet the Lord said, we must go back. And we didn't know where we will be going. Even the school I am now, the principal of this uh, SIAX, I didn't even know that existed. All we know was the light was given to the next step. And my professor here at Asbury, he told me, Prabhu, the, there is an opening in one big university. I think you will fit in. I'm writing to you. Why don't you apply? And I remember writing a mail to him saying, God will not give a full blueprint, but he will give us enough light for the next step. And the next step is for us to go back to India. And I remember we went back to India the first day. Now, we, we landed up in my father-in-law's place in Salem. And uh, there's a room in the first floor. I still, I can visualize it. The morning that I came and I sat on that, you know, staircase. And I, I was like, Lord, you asked us to come. Now what? Right? We never know. Like, you know, no blueprint was given. That's why it's called as, you know, life of faith, right? It's a journey of faith. And as I asked that question to the Lord, I felt the Lord, uh, the song rose in my heart. The song says, you know, God will make a way where there seems to be no way, right? Uh, so even in our low, own life sometimes, uh, why I say that is that David would have thought, Lord, why did this happen to me? I obeyed you, God. I was happily taking care of the sheep, you know, uh, singing songs and, you know, hunting after bears and lions and uh, practicing my guitar and, you know, all those stuff. But why? Why, Lord, this is happening to me? He could have asked, right? Sometimes we never know the whole things, why certain things are unfolding. Yet the calling is to trust the Lord, right? That is the walk of faith, to trust the Lord that God is good through all circumstances and continue to hold on to him. And that's the calling that the Lord is calling. And so when Samuel was finally struck with these seven people and Samuel asked Jesse, we would have expected Jesse to come and say, right? David's father to say, wait, wait, Samuel, you know, hey, we got only seven people, but there is one more guy up there. He didn't say that. It was Samuel who asked him, okay? It was Samuel who asked him, is the all you got or have you got any more children? And then he says, Oh, we got the youngest one, but, uh, you know, maybe he's not of that, you know, royal material, right? He's too young, and he is there with the sheep. And Samuel says, no, 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 we won't sit down until he comes. And then when he came, the Lord told Samuel, this is the man, right, anoint him. Young boy, probably in his teenage, and the Lord anoints David, right? And the next step, you see him, David, suddenly overnight becomes the hot throb of the nation in the next chapter, uh, he goes to, you know, the battlefield to see what his uh, brothers were doing. And then, you know, the famous battle of Goliath. And overnight, he became the heartthrob of the whole nation, right? He's the darling now of Israel. But what happened along with that? What happens? Sometimes, you know, uh, envy and jealousy can come. So when I was doing a series, I did a whole sermon on how, how to handle success. And I talked about two, two things to that. One is to handling your own success. Even, even 
That is very difficult, you know, to handle your success in the right way. But sometimes what is more difficult is handle someone else's success, right? Handle someone else's success who is closer to you. And that is what happened to Saul, right? When, when the women came out singing, and uh, is this not David, you know, David who killed, uh, Saul who killed thousand, and David killed tens of thousands, right? It's important, one of the key principles, whether you're in ministry, whether you're in um, whatever ways of life the Lord has put you in, it's very important to go through life without comparing with others. This is one of the fundamental things that people these days go through, uh, I, 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 what I call as perpetual discontentment. Okay? There are people who live with perpetual discontentment because constantly they keep comparing with, you know, what happened to them? Oh, they got this now. I Thank God somebody got promotion here. Oh, they got a promotion, you know, now, now when is my promotion happening, right? There is no end to this kind of uh, living when you begin to compare rather than looking up to God and trusting God and thanking God for what God has given. So that's very important uh, principle for our lives. Uh, uh, I think it was David Galbraith who was a former ambassador to India. He was a great economist and he got a great statement. He says that how envy operates particularly, you know, when it is related to the closest of people, okay? Uh, the, uh, the intensity of envy is often directly proportional to the proximity of the people. Okay? Uh, we don't get envious of uh, Bill Gates, right? but we may become envious of somebody who just got a promotion. So, so it, it's very important. And in the world of social media, what has happened is that I, because I deal with a lot of young people in our, uh, in our colleges and in, even in ministry, the big pressure is, oh, he's got that big church. Lord, why is my church like that, right? Or, you know, they got so many people come. Why am I still here? And this it breeds that particularly in social media because what do you do? You constantly see somebody, you know, like in their Facebook or something, put that great vacation they have gone, you know, or that uh, the beautiful photograph and all of them are carefully photoshopped and curated and, you know, <laughs> made to look so pretty and beautiful and more... Uh, uh, you know, happier than they actually are. And then people look at it and say, hey, you know, they've gone there, you know, next time we must go here. There is a perpetual discontentment it can grow if you don't guard your soul and if you are not content in the Lord and be thankful to God for what you have and trusting God for what you don't have. Okay? It's an important principle in life. Thanking God for what you have and trusting God for what you don't have. And, uh, and, and this is what happened with Saul. Entire life. You notice what happened after that? His entire life got spent in just chasing after David. He forgot that he was the first king. He forgot he was the king of the nation of Israel, the people of God. He forgot all the blessings God gave. But he went hunting after David. And poor David now, you know, suddenly life had changed. He runs from place to place because now David, uh, Saul is hunting him. He first went to Jonathan. We read that in chapter 20. He went to Jonathan and said, Jonathan, what did I do? Why is your dad after me? And then uh, Jonathan finally understood that Saul really wanted to kill David. And he said, David, it's better you run away from this place. Okay. So overnight, the heartthrob of the nation now has become a fugitive. He's running from place to place. He's going from place to place. And when you come to chapter 21, you see David goes to Nob, right? Nob, where the priest was there. And then, uh, you know, the priest, uh, you know, he picked up some bread from the priest and he got the, the sword. He said, do you have a sword? He said, yeah, we have the sword with which you killed, uh, you know, Goliath. And then he took that sword. And then from there, where did David go in chapter 21? He goes to a place called Gath, okay? Gath is in, you know, Gath is the, you know, kind of the key city of the Philistines, and that is where Goliath came from, okay? And David goes to Gath, to the king of Achish, thinking that he could find refuge with him. You see what happens when you go through difficult times, it kind of disorients you. David here, rather than trusting God, he's going to his enemies and trying to find, you know, security there. Many years later, you will notice David again in verse chapter 27 will make a great mistake of going back to the Philistine country and he will really go through severe consequences because of that. But now I want to focus on chapter 22. 
David escaped the hands of the Philistines because the Philistines didn't believe in him, okay? They said, hey, is this not the guy? You look at chapter 21 and uh, verse 11, okay, 21 verse 11. The servants of the Akish said to him, isn't this the David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Meaning, David has forgotten, you know, what God did with him to, during a Goliath, but these people have not forgotten. And I think this song has kind of become the number one in the billboards chart of that time, okay? So, like, you know, they were remembering, the Philistines were remembering, hey, is this the song that, you know, their, their girls and everybody were dancing about because, you know, David had killed tens of thousands. And then they tried to, you know, attack him. And what did David do? In verse 11, 13, he pretended that he was insane. He pretended to be a madman and he let the saliva run down his face and the beard and he somehow he escapes that place. And then he comes to this place, you know, in chapter 22, verse 1. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Okay, this is a cave near Bethlehem where David's uh, uh, hometown is. And then he comes to that cave. Now you see David in that cave. Where does he come now? The whole world is turned upside down. David the darling is now David the fugitive, and then he is now in that cave. So how would God restore a young David? Remember, he was still a very, very young man, probably in his very early 20s, just a young man. And how would God restore David? When you and I go through difficult circumstances, like cave-like circumstances, how do we overcome the first, I want to briefly place before you three principles that would help us in dealing with these cave experiences. The first one is to seek God's perspective, okay, to seek God's perspective. When we go through difficult circumstances, it is always good to seek God's perspective, okay? Rather than sometimes questioning God, it's good to ask God, God, what are you doing with me at this time? Lord, why is this happening to me? Would you please give me your perspective upon my situation, right? That's why the Bible says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They should soar on wings like the eagles, right? In other words, as you go up, you get the bird's eye perspective. When you wait upon the Lord, when you see God's perspective, you get a bird's eye perspective of what is happening, why the Lord is doing whatever he is doing with our lives. Remember, David's trajectory was always upward, right? Uh, it was so quick. It was so dramatic. It was overnight. He was kind of in a right above everybody in the nation except King Saul. And David had to go through that moment because God was preparing David for a much bigger role in the future, right? So he had to go through those difficult moments to understand the pains and to understand the circumstances because David needed to trust only God. And God had put him through those wilderness because it is the wilderness is often the place of testing. It is the place of trusting. It is the place where God wants to see whether you would trust the Lord. And God allows sometimes moments of wilderness in our own life so that we would get a proper perspective. So what do you to understand when we go through difficult times, ask God, God, what is your perspective? And somehow in this process during the cave, it's interesting that you, know, you will see that David have kind of uh, recovered his sense of trust in God. Okay, Because he was disoriented, suddenly what was going on, he was running to Jonathan, he was running to the priest, he was even running to the enemy king to find his security. But now as he came to the cave and he began to seek the Lord and slowly his life begins to change by trusting God. Let me show you um, a, a, a psalm that David wrote. There are many cave psalms, okay? It's, it's very interesting. If you see through the uh, several psalms, the, you will see the, uh, you know, the uh, highlighted there that would say that, you know, David wrote this when he was in the cave and things like that. But there is this psalm. In our family, as many of us know, uh, Psalm 34, okay, uh, uh, Abimelech and also Akish, uh, you know, so uh, of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech when he drove him away and he left, okay? This is a psalm that David wrote when he escaped from the Philistine 
and then as he came to you know Adullam. But I want you to notice how many times here David emphasizes the Lord. Okay, just see the word the Lord. Okay, verse one, I will extol the Lord. Verse two, I will glory in the Lord. You know, three, glorify the Lord. Four, I sought the Lord. Right, and uh, six, the poor man called and the Lord heard him. And seven, the angel of the Lord, right? Eight, taste and see that the Lord is good. And verse nine, fear the Lord. And verse 10, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And 11, you know, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And as you keep uh, coming down chapter, verse 15, the eyes of the Lord, right? The eyes of the Lord. And verse 16, the face of the Lord. Verse 17, the righteous cried, and the Lord hears them. Verse 18, the Lord is close to the uh, brokenhearted. Verse 19, the Lord delivers him from, from all. And finally, in verse 22, the Lord will rescue his servants, right? And no one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Suddenly, David realizes, you know, my refuge is in the Lord. It's not in Jonathan, who is the son of the king. It's not in the priest, or it's not in the other powerful king, Akish. But my refuge is in the Lord, right? Refuge is in the Lord. So when we go through this difficult moments, it's important to seek God's perspective and allow God to speak to us. And in those moments, the Lord encourages and reveals himself to know that, you know, he is the one who is in control. Can you uh, give me another example of a famous cave experience of a great man in the Bible? Huh? Paul, okay, where, which cave? Any? Huh? Elijah, right? Yeah, Elijah has a you know, literal cave. You remember the story, 1 Kings chapter 18? Elijah single-handedly defeated 14 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Asherah on Mount Carmel, single-handedly did. And the next chapter, we read in chapter 19 that the wicked queen Jezebel says, what you did to my prophets, I'm going to do to you. And what did Elijah do? Verse 3, 19.3 says, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And then he would go into the wilderness. He would lie down under the broom tree and say, Lord, let me die. And the angel would give him food and water. You remember the story? Then strengthened by that food for 40 days, he would walk 40 days and 40 nights, and he would reach Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, right? That was the, also called as Mount Sinai. That's where the Lord revealed to Moses. And now he goes to that mountain, and he finds a cave, and he is inside, literally a cave, and he goes inside. And we read in verse 9, the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Beautiful. Even when God's people, these are the giants of faith, right? Even when they go through those moments, the Lord never abandons his people, right? Doesn't matter what you and I go through, yet we can trust in this Lord because he never abandons. Even to that cave, he comes and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah gives all his problem list. You know that story? And then what did the Lord answer? Any idea? What did the Lord say? Let me test your... Huh? Huh? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. The 7,000 will come a little later. But before that, what do you say? He says, come and stand at the entrance to the cave. The Lord is about to pass by, Right? And there was a wind, there was an earthquake, there was a fire, the Lord was not there. In, and then in the still small voice, the Lord would say, what are you doing here, Elijah? And the Lord would reveal in a fresh way to Elijah. And then he will tell, we got 7,000 people, right? Because first, Elijah needs to know in a fresh way, he must have a new perspective of God. The God who has called him, the God to whom he belonged, the God whom he served. So God revealed himself to Elijah. So when our own conquering our own caves, important thing is to not to abandon God, not to run away, but just to seek God, seeking God's perspective on our lives and to hold on to him. And the second uh, principle we can learn here is the second one. The first one I said, seek God's perspective. And second is serve 
God's purpose. Okay, serve God's purpose. Even in your difficult circumstances. You know, often I think sometimes psychologists say, if people who are very down in their spirit always say, you know, go out and find somebody who was much down than you and, you know, try and help out. You know, go out into the community and seek the poor and the lonely and the needy. And you see, when you begin to serve others, when you begin to see, you begin to grasp a purpose that is bigger than you. Okay? Uh, so, because when you go through cave circumstances, often what happens? We begin to focus the whole attention on us. But when you begin to see God's perspective, God says that, hey, even during this time, you know, through this experience, I have a purpose for you. Right? Sometimes we even we can't understand why these are happening, but still through that, the Lord's purposes would continue to unfold. You see what happened here? When he was in the cave, his father's household, they heard about him and they all came there. And verse 2, all those who were in distress or in debt, or discontented, gather around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. Okay. Interesting, isn't it? These are not the cream of the crop. These are not the guys coming from you know, IIT, MITs, you know, not that guy. These are all kind of, you know, the worst in the society. But all of them rallied to David there. And then the Lord said, David, during this time, this is your purpose, right? What God was doing, because God was giving training to David that one day before he could lead the big army, before he could become the king, that he would be able to mold people like this. Difficult people. And God was bringing them right to where he was. And God was giving him a purpose in life even during that time. So when we go through whatever circumstances we are, it is important to ask, Lord, what do you want me to do, Lord? What is your purpose for my life? Is there something I can do even in the midst of this, right? The famous story, uh, we all, most of us know of the, you know, Joni Erickson Tada, you know, the young girl who broke her neck in a swimming accident and uh, how for her entire life confined to bed, you know, immobile under her neck and still to ask question, Lord, what do you want me to do, God, right? How can I serve your purpose even in these circumstances? And out of that, some amazing ministries came out in of her life. So you notice here, even here, because later on, when you study David's life, all his commanders, the 30 mighty men, all of them would come out of this bunch of people, okay? And it's important that to ask ourselves is, Lord, and it's important to say, Lord, what, do you ha what, what have you given in my life? What do I have in my hand? Okay. Rather than saying, by now, Lord, I should have been the king of Israel. But the other way is to say, Lord, if you have brought these 400, I'm going to do the best that I can be with them. Right? It's important. Because sometimes what happens, you know, these days with young people and I, because we train a lot of, you know, ministers, you know, we, we, we constantly say, oh, I would be like that if only I get that pulpit, right? Oh, if only I become a pastor of that church, you must see, you know, what I can do. But the question is, but what do you do now? With what God has given you, what do you do? And the Lord says that, you know, you are faithful in little things, and I'm going to make you, you know, uh, 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 in charge of greater things, you know, in the parable of the talents that he said. Serve God's purpose, whatever it could be in your own life. You ask yourself, you know, in your own network, in your own work, you know, wherever God has placed you, what can I do for the Lord here, okay? Uh, we could never have ideal circumstances in our lives, but ask ourselves, I, I sometimes ask myself, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Lord, I wish I were the, you know, the leader of this community, you know, probably 10 years ago, 20 years ago, because things were so easier, you know, in my mind, at least I think things used to be easier at the time. We didn't have all those, uh, you know, the situation and the oppositions and persecution and all those things. It would have been easier. Or, you know, pre-pandemic days, you know, things would have been easier. But the whole question is, what do you do with the times that is given? God has a purpose in keeping you and me where we are, the time that we are. Do you remember Esther? That's what, you know, Mordecai said told young yesterday, right? Esther, why has God put you in this position for such a time as this? Right? For such a time as this. So we need to serve God's purposes. Wherever God has placed you, 
in whatever circumstances you are in. You ask God, God, how can I serve your purpose even in this cave-like experience? Like, and you would see how God can amazingly, you know, God can bless your, your life. And the last one, okay, the third principle before I conclude, the third principle is to the first one I said, seek God's perspective, right? Second one, serve God's purpose. Third is synergize with God's people. Synergize with God's people. One of the most dangerous thing when we go through cave experience is to, but that's a tendency, human tendency is to withdraw, right? Just like Elijah did, right? He even left his uh, companion and he walked all alone into the wilderness because there is a tendency to cut ourselves from people. But David would not do that. He would continue to synergize with God's people, right? He had his uh, parents and you notice when his brothers and his fathers, they came down to him in, in verse 1, right? These, some of them among the brothers are the people who didn't like David because David was anointed in front of them. Okay, if you read, uh, you know, that chapter 16, you will notice. And the brother, you know, the, young, the eldest brother, how much he shouted at David uh, when the battlefield, right? I know how wicked you are. Why do you come here, you know? There was not all the great good relationship between those brothers, okay? But even when their brothers came, David could have said, hey, why did you come? Leave me alone. I am already in a cave on my own. Why have you come? I need to now take care of you also. Why have you come? David didn't do that, right? He embraced his family. And then the 400 people came, you notice, he embraced them as well. And then what happened, you notice in, in verse 3, verse 3, from there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? You see? So he's taking responsibility of his parents and he's putting them in a safe place with the king of Moab and then he says, you know, can you please keep them until I learn what is God doing with my life, right? That's why I told first, seek God's perspective. Seek God's perspective. And then what he, we read is that, verse 4 and 5, then he left them with the king and then he stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. They stayed with him. Verse 5, but the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold, go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Herod. So now a prophet comes. This prophet will stay with David throughout. You will, you will see him much later when David counts the men in the army, which the Lord asked him not to do. It is the same prophet. God will come and reprimand him. So that prophet says, David, you need to go out of this cave. And then what did David do? He moved out of the place, right? He was listening to God's voice. He was seeking God's perspective. But also you notice that David was working with people, right? Uh, he was now with the prophet, uh, he was with these 400 people and he had his brothers and, you know, his, his parents. And it's important we need to recognize, you know, life is not to be lived alone because it's so important. We are wired in such a way, we are built, you know, humanly, we are built in such a way that it's important to synergize, particularly with God's people. When you go through difficult times, uh, you know, we, we often hear people say, no, 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 why should I read the Bible, right? Why should I pray, Lord? Why should I come to church? Because I have a problem, you know, I won't come. That's not the way to deal with your own cave experiences, but rather to come together. And then when you come together, even within the church, it's important that each of you, you know, need to look out for one another, right? Uh, we need to, you know, help each other because each of us, we all go through our own difficult, our own cave experience. Some of them are told outside, some of them are not told but, you know, the church that comes together in supporting each other, I think that's the church that will grow. That's the church that will thrive when the church, you know, when the, 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 the people of God are synergized, you know, with one another. And that is what David was doing here. He was not withdrawing from people, but rather he was synergizing with God's people. Let me close with a story of a man who went through very difficult times in his own life. So he was so angry with God and he decided to stop going to church. So for a few weeks, he, done, he didn't come to church and the pastor waited and waited and waited and he didn't come. So one day he went to his home and he was all alone and he was angry with God. And uh, so he was sitting, it was a winter time. Uh, it happened, I think, in England or somewhere. And he, he sat there all alone near the fireplace with the wood, firewood burning 
and the pastor went and he just sat with him. He didn't talk anything. He just sat along with him. And this man was so angry and upset with God and with, with the pastor and with the church. And after some time, the pastor, uh, he walked over to the fireplace and he pulled one of the firewood, okay? And then he placed it separately from all the other bunch of firewood. And after some time, what happened? That single firewood, uh, that soon, that died down, right? The flames all died down. And the pastor sat for some more time and then he came back home, okay? And the next day, this man came back to the church. And uh, then when he met with the pastor, he said, uh, thank you, pastor, for uh, reminding me the other day. Thank you for visiting me and reminding me the other day uh, the importance of being part of God's community. Right? And then he said, I really want to thank you for that fiery sermon you gave me. Right? Uh, that was probably the most fiery sermon that was spoken without words, but he understood the point, right? That we need to continue to be together as one God's family, as we all together go through this life, helping each other so that God will be glorified. And through it all, we will continue to serve God's purpose. Shall we close our eyes and pray? Gracious Father, we come before you, Lord, uh, this morning as your children and as your people. Thank you, Lord, for my dear brothers and sisters who have gathered here today. And as we live in a fallen world, Lord, in a flawed environment, Father, we understand our own cave experiences that we go through. But in the midst of it all, thank you for your grace and your mercy that continues to strengthen us, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for these incidents in the life of your people like David and Elijah that continues to motivate us, encourage us, and uh, making us to focus upon you, Lord. Fix our eyes upon you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So today, Lord, this morning, I pray for our people, Lord, who were as going through difficult moments. It's my prayer, Lord, that you would stretch your hand. And even in those difficult moments, Lord, you continue to shape them and mold them, Lord, and prepare them for the higher calling, for the greater purpose that you have in their lives, Lord. Continue to bless your children. I pray for this church, Lord, as they may continue to be united, and Lord, they may grow and glow together for your kingdom purposes. We ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for... Uh powerful world. I believe it's uh, fitting and very timely.